For some time now we've analyzed variations within the Sicilian and hopefully you've managed to build yourself a repertoire which can stand against even quite advanced players. But even though the Sicilian is one of the most popular openings, there are lots of other variations one has to learn. So after analyzing e4 openings, why not begin to see what happens after white's first move d4. Today we'll take a look at the Grinfeld defense. Alfred, what is black supposed to play here in order to get into the Grinfeld defense? First of all, black has to begin by playing knight to f6. But before we continue even further, I have to tell you that this opening is very aggressive and that positions might occur where one has to be really certain on his moves because a mistake in the Greenfield often equals a loss. The Greenfield was first introduced in the 1850s, but after resulting in a loss, it never became especially popular until Ernst Greenfield picked it up and introduced it with a stunning efficiency in the Vienna tournament 1922, where he won against Alexander Aljechin with it. In later days, it has been well used by Bobby Fischer and Garry Kasparov and many other players from the absolute top of the chess world. Well, in this position, white, as you probably know, has a lot of moves to choose from. Among them are c4, bishop to g5, knight to f3, and so on. But for the Grunfeld to be played, white has to play c4 here. And for those who don't know it, c4 is the most popular continuation. Black answers by playing g6, preparing the game for either a king's Indian or a Grunfeld and white continues with the most common of moves by playing knight to c3. In a normal king's indian, bishop to g7 is played here, and that is probably what white expects. But in order to enter the greenfield, black is to play d5 in this position. I might have given you the impression that this is an obscure move, but that's not really true. This is actually a well, quite well-liked variation. White does here play c takes d5, and black recaptures with the knight. Where after white plays e4 and black exchanges knights on c3. At first glance, white's position seems to be extraordinary. There are not that many variations which grant such a beautiful center. But of course this is only temporary and black's bishop to g7, which begins with putting pressure on the white center. And white answers by playing knight to f3 which is followed by black c5. This is a very important turning point in the game. White has so many options where many of them are good. Among other rook to b1, bishop to e3, and bishop to b5 checks are available. As black here, one would think that a capture on c5 would be a terrible mistake by white. This is it would allow black to capture on c3 with his bishop, thus winning the rook on a1, for, uh, for the bishop of course. But as you can see in this position, white has a really nice diagonal covered by the queen. And even though black has a material advantage, white's attacking possibilities evens out the score. But do notice that d takes on c5 is a mistake. But instead of capturing on c3 with the bishop, black should play knight b to d7, threatening the c5 pawn. White might try to move moves that, such as hc6, here in order to destroy black's pawn structure, but even though black will have a slight advantage after, after this. After white's rook to b1, which prohibits black from developing the bishop on c8 since it protects the pawn on b7, black plays another very important move, namely castle kingside. This is in turn followed by white's bishop to e2 and black's knight to c6. So, what was once considered a heavenly central pawn structure by white has now become the very center of black's attack. With that, we end this week's episode of The Opening School. We'll be back again next week with more on this opening, so don't miss that.